Hello, everyone. This is Eric Pennington with The Spirit of EQ, and welcome to The Spirit of EQ podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, Mr. Perry Moffmer, and we're going to talk about leadership development, what it could be and what it is not. I just made that up. <laughs> Life is a journey. Spirit of EQ helps shape and guide the road ahead for individuals, leaders, teams, and organizations striving to realize their full potential through emotional intelligence. Spirit of EQ is a coaching and consulting company that assists individuals and businesses to reach their full potential by developing emotional intelligence. In business, managers and leaders recognize the value of training to develop leadership skills. What they may not realize is that those skills are far more effective when they pay attention to not only performance, but also to people. Emotional intelligence is a crucial skill because people drive performance and emotions drive people. After this podcast, listen for a special opportunity to learn more. Joining me as always is Jeff East with the Spirit of EQ. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Hello, and everybody listening. So in the studio with us, Mr. Perry Moffmer. Hello, Perry. Hey, Eric. How you doing? I really, really appreciate you coming in and joining us today. You and I have had multiple conversations around leadership development, and some of them have been very pointed. And I th I'm going to go take you back in time. I remember you gave a talk once. And it was about leadership development. And, you know, I could I could look at the audience. I'm going, man, they're kind of on the edge of their seat, kind of what's he going to talk about and all that. Now, keeping in mind, I know you. So I knew it wasn't going to be the atypical. And then you you mentioned something about if you're thinking about getting into leadership, I would recommend that you don't. And the room, I mean, I looked around and I could tell it's like, wait a minute. He, did he did he really say that? And I realized Certainly, that beyond them being shocked, um, it really made me think. I was like, do we really count the cost around that? And some of what we're going to talk about today will be around are the leadership development programs that a number of companies use or are thinking about using, are they actually doing the job that it's being advertised to do? And then to talk about something that we kind of alluded to, or we had a brief conversation about um, this idea that, you know, truly leadership development programs uh, are, are just opening of a door. And I want to let you kind of elaborate on what that means going forward. But to set the context, Perry, um, I, I've mentioned to you as well, is that I think a lot of times leadership development, not only being two overly used words, is that it really hasn't moved the needle. I mean, when I look around, uh, whether it's inside business, outside business, I'm wondering to myself, okay, well, where are the, where's the change? Because if nothing else, in some ways, I'm thinking we're maybe kind of getting worse. So I put it together and I can go, oh, well, this is because, you know, if you market a program well enough, you can get a company to buy it and do the program, and then they move on to the next shiny object in a year. I don't want to oversimplify, but that's kind of what goes through my head. So from your perspective, let's start with what's not working with leadership development programs in your mind? Well, I think the two things that come to mind are we're trying to make leadership and leadership development efficient, which it should never be, mm. can never be, will never be. And so therefore, we're trying to, um, I think, as, a, as an unintended consequence, we're dumbing it down. And that dumbing down, Perry, do you mean is in the sense of like, hey, you can be a leader too. Now just do these five things and you're going to be a great leader. Is that? Yeah, there's no, there's no checklist, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's the, the inefficiency of it. And I've had this conversation with uh, four or five leaders recently where everybody wants a checklist. Mm -hmm. They want to know, I want to, I want to train these leaders. How do I train them? I said, well, you don't train them. You train dogs, you train chimps, <laughs> you know, you don't train people. Right. Uh, and especially in leadership, because leadership is not a technical skill. And so we want it to be because we want it to be efficient. We want to train efficiently. We want, we want somebody to go in and go through a course or something. And then they come out newly minted and knighted a leader. Yeah. And doesn't work. So, okay, Perry, uh, and hearing that I kind of go, are we running to that type of process because 
we actually feel, either feel or know that it would that it has a great chance to work, or are we doing it because it's kind of easier? I don't know. That's just kind of what goes through my head. Well, we we want it. I mean, everybody wants it. Everybody knows the value of it. We recognize that there's a, there's a distinct difference between what we have and what we want mm. in organizations. And it's kind of like, I hate to use this example, but back in the, I think it was 60s or 70s, there was a chief justice named Potter Stewart. Okay. And he said uh, they were doing a trial about pornography. And they asked him, well, how do you know if something's pornographic? And he said, well, I can't tell you, but I know it when I see it. Yes, I remember that. Quote. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. but same thing with leadership. It's very hard to define, but you know it when you see it. You know it when you see good leadership, and you know it when you see really, really poor leadership. But yeah. it's hard to define, and that goes back to efficiency. We we want to have a clear definition where it's like you do this, and you will be a leader, and that's impossible. So you know, if I'm putting myself in the shoes of a business owner. Uh, regardless of the size of the business, right? Or, or even maybe I'm a CEO of a publicly traded company. What's one piece of advice would you give to that business owner or maybe a CEO of a large enterprise company if they're considering doing a leadership program? Ask the people you want to put in it if they want to do it. Can you unwrap that a little bit more? Well, so first of all, we, we select people. You know, we tell people, well, we're going to, the next phase for you is to enter a leadership development program. We don't typically ask them. And we also don't ask them to commit to the work it's going to take to do it. Because it is a behavioral change that requires lots of focus and energy from the participant. There's a cost. We don't ask them if they want to pay the fee. And Jeff, I I think you and I, it might have been earlier this week where where I, I was I mean, I'm trying to think of the interaction when we, what we were talking about specifically, but it was something to the effect that the reasons why people do what they do in environments where they're trying to get something that, as you alluded to earlier, you know, I, everybody wants it, but we're standing there. It was at that event, yeah, I think so. you know, and this, this guy, he's coming up to us and like straight out of the gate, he's, you know, boom, 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 boom. And I, I know I didn't ask you specifically this, but I was thinking to myself, I, I really don't even need to be here. I just need to say I'll buy it. <laughs> and it's kind of like he it felt like he had been through a program that said, just keep doing this over and over. Just keep doing this over and over and you'll get the result. He's, he said the exact same thing to you that he said to me as was, he went down was, the line. Yeah, it was almost like a verbatim. Right. And I know it wasn't like, a. I mean, it was poor leadership in the sense that his influence was going nowhere, <laughs> but, <laughs> but in, in the sense of it, uh, of what you're saying. So the owner, the CEO, if I use those, that, uh, that descriptor, are they afraid to ask? No, they assume. So, Why wouldn't people want to be leaders? And see, I asked the other question. Why would you? Okay. That's a great place to, to, to continue on, uh, Perry, because that goes to that part about in that talk you gave. I, I, I would try to talk you out of it. So kind of keep going there. No, I, I do actively try to talk people out of it. And I actually, in the, in the programs that I do, I make people sign a paper that says, I will commit to doing the work required so that I can pull that back out later when they tell me they didn't do it. Right. Because it's a, it's a long slog. Yeah. Right. It's, it's a, it's a quest. It's an odyssey. You call it whatever you want, but it's never done. You know, that's why, that's why the relentless piece comes out. Mm-hmm. You know, the tagline for what I do is you're done when you're dead, right? Because mm-hmm. if you ever stop developing as a leader, and leader by definition is merely influence. So yep. everybody I come in contact with, I can influence in some way, shape, or form. Yep. If I choose to do that in a positive way, that's a benefit. But you have to sign up for that, and you have to sign up for the fact that 90% of the time, it's going to hurt. Like you're not being reinforced. You're not getting propped up as a leader. That doesn't happen. You give more than you get. Mm. Now, the benefit is, is those times you do get back, it is so incredible that it pays for all the other stuff you did. <laughs> kind of like parenting? Yeah, it's exactly <laughs> like parenting. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. But that's, I think that's why people, we recognize the need for it mm-hmm. because there's such a glaring lack of it. I know, uh, Jeff, when you and I have done joint presentations and even some of the trainings, you, you, 
will say to folks, disclaimer, if you're not willing to show up to practice and put in the work, this exactly. is a colossal waste of your time and money. And I know from my perspective, I'm farther, I'm far enough down the road in life. I don't want any more of the experiences of I'll just do it anyway. I would rather, like you say, I'd rather talk you out of it. Emotional intelligence is that same kind of, it's mm -hmm. traveling on the same road. You can't take a, an assessment, get a debrief, and then all of a sudden you're going to be able to recognize patterns or you're going to have more <laughs> empathy. You're going to navigate emotions. It, it is. It's, it's long, hard work. I'm going to come a little bit back to that idea about assumption. They, they assume that everybody wants it. What have you found, and maybe in some of your experiences, when those questions have been asked, when they, when, when you get a CEO or get an owner that says, do you guys want to do this? Is this something you want to commit to? How has that gone? What are some of the things you've heard from, from those, those folks? Well, I think that everybody on the surface, can, intellectually, like everybody wants to be a leader for some reason. I mean, I, I've taught MBA programs for years and I ask everybody in there, who wants to be a leader? And 90% of them raise their hand. And my next question is, why? Give me a reason. Give me a meaningful reason that's either qualitative or quantitative as to why you want to be a leader, not just because it's some head trash about what you should be doing. Because hmm. it's not the path, right, for everybody. It's not. And we, we do everybody a disservice because we make them think it is. So, so the, the motivation, is, is it extrinsic or intrinsic, is the question you're really asking the people. Yeah, is it something that you've been told you should be because that's success? Like everybody should strive to be a leader. That's, I'll say garbage. That's not my normal verbiage, but I'll say garbage. I did tell Jeff earlier that we were going to allow for some normal well, I've, verbiage. I've heard him speak, so. <laughs> I, I, I was asking if we should put so it on delay. So don't hold back. Be, our, uh, be, be, be free. Um, we kind of likened to it. We were not expecting you would probably go Joe Rogan on us or anything. No, but, no um, I know. I, I try to be respectful of the audience. <laughs> oh, my. So, uh with that, you know, because I, I, I would imagine maybe if, if, if I am that business owner, that that uh, that CEO, and I, I heard you say that, I, I mean, maybe I'm going to feel a little down, like, well, my gosh, uh, how do I even know that I got people that are really willing to do all that? I don't even know if I'm willing to do all that. And I may be running a company that's worth millions of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So is there a way out? Is there that moment where you can say, okay, time out? Time to do a, a checkup before we go any further? Or is it, well, I guess it's not for me. Uh, no, I th you always got to leave people. You, you always got to leave them an out. And you always have to give them something where they can at least evaluate it truthfully and honestly. Yeah. Um, it, and so the way I, so for me, it's easy because what I created is a program that, and it's right off the bat, I get to know where they're at because I tell them it's 14 months. And that's just to start then I'm done after 14 months and you guys take it from here. But there is no, you know, there's, there's four steps to doing anything. If you want to change behavior, if you want to learn a language, if, this is science. You can, it's not mine. It's, you can go look it up. There's four steps, right? Increased awareness, mm -hmm. focused attention, deliberate practice, and accountability. Without those four steps, you can't change anything. So you tell me how you're going to do that in a one-day seminar. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Cause I'm thinking about Jeff to some of our points, you know, when we started out early on with spirit of EQ, I kind of went a little radical. I don't think it was too radical for you, not, Jeff. not too you much, know, you know, minimum a year contract. Cause I, I can't, I can't get the results or help you get the results by just coming in doing a one-off or, or a one-off plus a follow-up session. It's, it's fool's gold. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's truly that. So I want to shift a little bit. You know, you mentioned your program, and that program is called Relentless Leadership. And I know that it's fairly new in as much as being out in the marketplace. Can you talk a little bit about the program um, and maybe even more importantly, how did it come to be? Uh, yeah, and it is it's so new. It isn't there yet. Right. Oh, very uh, so cool. it's it's uh, something that I've just kind of started talking about and writing about. And it's it really is just accumulation of. 25 years of experience. Yep. And so what I tried to do is come up and what I've developed are these kind of 12 core tenants that are simple. Um, it's a formula for me. They're all three words and they're all very uh, vague. 
because here's the other thing about leadership and inefficiency is I have six people in a room. We're going to go through this program. All six of them are going to be different. Yep. They're not going to exhibit these things or they're not going to internalize them in the same way. Because for me, for folks to get it, they have to be able to internalize the concept and then bring it back out in a way that's authentic to them. So we're going to have six different types of leaders that are all sharing similar tenets. Mm-hmm. You know, so when I say, um, when we're talking about one of the things, so here, here we go. We're going to go off script a little bit, right? So right. my the very first tenant, which everybody loves, it's the one that gets everybody's attention, which is tolerate no bullshit. That's the first tenant. Now, what we start with is you have to not tolerate your own bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So everybody gets it. Like we all understand what that means, but we all employ it in a different way that what it means to us and then how we interact with somebody and how we call somebody on it. So it's a concept that we can all get behind because we all agree that we can share that, that vocabulary, but how we all talk to somebody about it is, is our own way. And that's what the challenge with leadership is and why it isn't efficient is it has to be authentic and authenticity is not efficient. So in some ways it's embracing counter to what maybe you've known before, right? Uh, the norms. Yeah. It's just, you, you can't do it as somebody else does it. That's what leadership is. You have to create your own sense of leadership and what mm. me, how you're going to, how you're going to come off as authentic. Cause the last thing you want to be is an inauthentic leader. If I'm parroting something that somebody else has told me, because that's the, that's the verb, you know, that's the thing I have to say in this. I have to give you three compliments for every criticism. If I have to do some, wild ass formula like that. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it doesn't come off as something that I believe. Yeah. Right. And you know, it's interesting. I had a friend ask me, I I guess I don't want to give away my total age. uh, Even though I started this when I was five, (laughs) (laughs) he asked me, do you still have energy to pursue the, the kind of things that you pursue? And I said, yeah. I said, however, there has been one change. The stuff that I really don't care about, I don't, and I don't participate. And that took me a long time to get to a place where I could say that not only here with my lips, Mm -hmm. but in my heart and not feel like, oh my gosh, what will Perry and Jeff think of me if I say no to that? (laughs) Now it's, it's not my thing. Wouldn't bother me. I it'd take a while for me to get to that (laughs) position too. But yeah, it's figuring out what is really important and why you want to do it, the motivation for it. Well, I think if more people maybe understood the brevity of life, they might get more serious about it. I sometimes think that was kind of my catalyst is like, I, you know, wake up one day and going, you may think you're young, <laughs> but uh, there's more time behind you than more than likely is in front of you. And, and, and I say that uh, hopefully it doesn't sound to our listeners morbid. It's really quite liberating. It's, it's really quite uh, motivating because it's kind of like, I got to get after the things that are important to me versus trying to chase down stuff that I, it's not my thing. There's a great stoic quote that life well lived is long enough. Mm -hmm. Ooh, love that. Yeah. That's a marker. So when, when you've seen what happens to the person that has been lassoed into a development program, what happens to them? If especially if they're you know pulled in kicking and you know that doesn't work and it and, and and so you have to be clear with people as to the the commitment right and it has to be about them and that, this is where I come at what I do right for for relentless leadership I'm not trying to m- help people become better leaders I'm trying to help them become better humans Have you seen people damaged? I see them all the time, right? I see them. I, I set. It's it's funny because people get set free if they get into the right place, right? They finally realize, oh, this isn't a. I don't. I don't. This isn't a checklist. Like I'm not supposed to go back and just. Oh, I did that, right? I, I really get to participate. Like you, you're going to ask me a question and let me answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And on top of that, you're going to incorporate what I said into our next. Like you're really going to listen. Like you're going to take what I say and it's important and it's meaningful. And it's not wrong? So that you led me to another question then. There's a, a lot of companies that would not really want to have leaders. Most of them. Yeah. That, that's why That's why. What um, I look at myself, it's a very niche market. Because I, I, I don't have the patience 
or the temperament to deal with that. I, I want to work with people who want to transform their lives and, and therefore transform a company. The lives first. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's where it starts because there is no such uh, the company. Uh, the, a company is an artificial construct. There is no company or organization. It's a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. if, if the company changes, it's because all the people changed. And when you sit in a room with people and you see that light go off to where they're like, oh, wait a minute. You mean I can do this? And not only here, but I can be a better husband or wife or brother or parent or friend. Oh, and by the way, be a better person inside the organization as a deep, you know, as a as an unintended consequence. Well, that's awesome. And that's where people embrace it because I'm not talking to them about them in the context of their job. Like we're not doing this so you can be a better ex and you can produce more revenue for the company. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about you growing as a human being. Hmm. And then the, the, the downstream impact of that is your clients are happier and you have better retention. You have better profitability and you have better, you have more market share because you have a whole bunch of humans who are self actualizing people that want to come to work. Yeah. Well, they want to, they want to do, they want to be them mm -hmm. like they, they connect now they connect with something, you know, um, I think it was Daniel Pink said the three, the three components to motivation are autonomy, mastery, and purpose. You know, I have to have some level of autonomy in what I do. I have to be able to get better at what I do. And I have to connect to something bigger than me. That's what this is. It's connecting to something bigger than you. It's, it's having an impact and being able to see how I treat another human being. I don't care what role you have, but I can have an impact on you and I can make your life better. That's meaningful to people. Perry, I have gone through my head here, this idea of, um, organizations for many of our listeners might be going that doesn't describe our company. And I don't, I don't, I don't know. Where do I go to get that? Right. And, and this is not a, uh, is not a me making light of, um, uh, of leadership development per se, as much as I, 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 I think about them and, and I'm kind of burdened about that place. Right. So if you were talking to someone and you may be, as I say this, out there in the audience, who's in that place and going, hey, I'm in a company where, no, no, that's not how we do it here. But I get what you're saying. What do I do? I mean, and that's a big, I know that's a lot of weighted question, but what do you think? What would you say to them? Well, I would quote John Wooden, don't let what you cannot do interfere with what you can. So one of the tenets of relentless leadership is something beats nothing. Well, because we get consumed with the big idea. So if I can't do all of it, I'm not going to do any, any of it. it. So something beats nothing is something beats nothing. Yeah. If you want to do, if you want to, if you want to <clears throat> become a leader, then do something different because I got news for you in any of those companies, nobody's stopping them. Nobody's stopping you from being a better person or being a better human or building somebody up instead of tearing them down. Nobody's stopping you. Yeah, I was going to say there's a conjures the idea that there's the thought police. Hey, yeah. wait a minute. You were thinking about being a better person. Right. <laughs> in the, you know, right. Yeah. You know, we're not having that here. Right? But, but we do. We get, we get wrapped up in, well, I want this. I want everybody to change. Like, I want my boss to change. And I want my supervisor to change. I want my peer to change. And I want us all to agree. Okay, that's awesome. But something beats nothing. Yeah. And you know what? Uh, I was thinking about this, Jeff, and we've, we've spoken about it before in previous episodes and, and in general. One of the ideas that I really like personally, just me, my daughter, junior at, uh, in college, and we were talking and she's an overachiever and she's got too much on her plate and she's just, I've got to do, I don't know, this and that. And She's at a place where she was talking about, I think I just want to, I just want to stop. And I go, well, why don't you? And there's this, that silence, right? And she goes, well, I, I don't know. Really? Take a, take a semester off, take, take a year off. But then you would be disappointed. And I go, uh, no, honey, no. And I said, you know what? You have more choices than you think you have. This is when we get ourselves boxed in, when we get ourselves in that, it's got to be this or nothing. Then the choices become really, really narrow. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. Just consider this statement. We don't believe things because they're true. They're true because we believe them. Mm -hmm. So anything we believe about ourselves or another person or our relationships or our abilities, 
They're only true because we believe them. It's completely arbitrary. So if we choose to believe something else, that also becomes true about what we can or cannot do. And the, the happy ending with my daughter is that it kind of gave her a sense, well, oh my gosh, well, I, then maybe I could take off a semester. or maybe, maybe I will do that internship. So all of a sudden she's starting to see there, there are more choices out there, right? And I get it. I, you know, it's easy for me to say in a, a, a podcast episode about how great that was and here's the place and the plan. I know if you're in the day in and day out and you're a listener out there and you're wondering, well, okay, so how do I apply it? I think what you alluded to is that starting is a starting point. Something is better than nothing, right? Recognizing that we have more choices than we think we do. This person may also go, hey, is the only option for me then is to find a company that looks at leadership the way you look at it? Or is it me just trying to work more on me and what my options are? Yes. <laughs> Good answer. I mean, it, it's, it's start where you're at. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's no matter if you found, you still have to do, see, this is a thing. No matter which of those options, you still have to do the work. So if you go to a company where they embrace all this, you still have to do the work. So you might as well start doing the work wherever you're at. Yeah. Get a head start. Instead of waiting for the perfect situation. Or I remember uh, <laughs> it was a marriage class. And there was a video. This guy says, you know, way too many people, when they think about marrying someone, they, they, they have this mindset of finding the one, one, one. One, you know, mm -hmm. this great echo, this great big thing, instead of why don't you just make it very practical and just get started? You know, well, I, I told all my kids and I tell all, you know, folks that are younger than me, I'm like, it ain't the hard part's not getting married, it's staying married. <laughs> yeah, that's, amen. And it's the same thing about leadership that, you know, nobody, nobody gets to be called your job, nobody's job as a leader. That's not anybody's job. It's leadership is how you do whatever you do. Wherever you are. Whenever you're there. Yeah. You keep making me think of questions. So I, I would I I'll make an assumption. A lot of companies will look at their org chart and go, these are the ones. Mm -hmm. What about those ones that maybe don't show up on the org chart that are the leaders? That's why I say the way to start any program is ask for people who want to apply. So if you're a service company and a technician goes, I want to do this. I had a, I had a great, to that point. So I had a company that I worked with and they had, um, they had identified leaders. They had said, okay, these are the people that we're going to, uh, we're going to um, suggest apply for this role. So we talked about it and they said, okay, we're going to do it differently. We're going to ask who's, who wants to do it. Well, they ended up with three candidates. The person that they thought was going to be the person ended up quitting. <laughs> and the person that nobody thought would even want the role and or qualified for the role ended up being the best fit for the role and is doing a uh, fantastic job six months later. It, the, the worst thing we can do is start to believe we know that we don't, this isn't, we don't anoint people <laughs> leaders, right? We got to get out of that headspace of we're somehow better off picking people to be leaders in organizations simply because of they're good at something or they've been around a long time or they have that role. They're next in line. Yeah. If you just ask, who, who really wants to be a leader? And by the way, here's all the work that's going to be required to do it. Then let people apply. Because if you've said, if you've raised your hand and said you want to do it, I now have a lever to get you to do something, right? I know that now I've got some, you've committed to this. You've said you want it. So now when, when things go bad and things get tough, I can come back to you and go, you wanted it. You said you wanted to be a part of this. So do the work. That's Otherwise, awesome. I, I don't have the energy to do it. I don't. I, there's no lever for me. There's no motivation for me to do it. I wonder, um, kind of coming back a little bit to relentless leadership and recognizing that you're kind of it's iterative, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and all that. How, how do you determine who is best suited for the program in its current state? Well, so the there's a couple things that people have to agree to. Okay. So I guess the easiest way to say that yeah. is that if any organization is going to do it, A, like I said, 14 months, eight meetings over 14 months, mm -hmm. right? The second component and probably the biggest one is I tell the leader of whoever is doing it, you have to do it too. Mm. Now, here's the catch. I don't charge the leader. 
They don't cost anything. They go for free. But by God, you better be there. In for a penny, in for a pound. (laughs) Because it's a shared vocabulary. So when you've got a group of leaders who all start talking about something and the the, the leader isn't there, what? how far is that going to go? Yeah, and I know that, Jeff, we've talked about that many times that, Mm -hmm. you know, doing an emotional intelligence program, one that lasts longer than, um, you know, uh, an assessment and debrief, you know, yeah, you have to because – if they're growing in their emotional intelligence and the leader is kind of off doing their thing. Well, I would fr- rephrase that. The manager's off doing their thing. Leader wouldn't be off doing their thing. <laughs> well yes. said. Right. Well said. But it's, well said. But don't you love that when some you get a hold of somebody and they say, yeah, I want you to come in and fix these people. <laughs> <laughs> Those folks over there, they if I could just get them to figure it out, uh, we'd be doing a lot better. Well, and isn't that <laughs> isn't that human nature, right? It's like on that flip that and it's that you know the frontline employee says well if we just had a better leader you know if we could just get somebody in here who knows how to run this company mm-hmm. then when the reality is and i'm guilty of it right i'm more prone to point out to other people where they need to correct and get better at and i'm less prone to look at myself and go well what what do you got to manage it, it makes me think my son is uh he, he's He's a bit of the uh, opinion guy, you know, well, this is the reason why, and this is why they're not doing it, and this is what they should do. And, and then he'll finish, and he'll ask me, well, what do you think, Dad? And I'll go, Grant, I got to tell you, man, I don't know where you have all this time to be focusing on other people. I know for me, I got so much stuff to deal with. I'll do well if I get myself together, let alone to point out where you need to get better. And again, talking about it out of the context of a leadership development mm-hmm. program, but the whole idea that if that manager, leader, CEO, whatever we want to call them, is going, my people need some help with this. Well, it's all together here, right? Well, the first thing, I, and I repeat it over and over and over again in, in uh, development situations with people. Whenever we're having a conversation, there's no judgment, no blame, and no shame. There mm-hmm. can never be judgment, blame, or shame because can't grow. Mm-hmm. And, but we spend so much of our time judging people that we don't have time to care about them. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, Wooden said, the, the foundation of all leadership is love. John Wooden said, he wrote a book, Leadership mm-hmm. is Love. And you can't, you can't lead people if you don't love people. I'm of the mind, you know, uh, when, when we, we started uh, with Spirit of EQ, uh, at least in the frame that I'm in, this desire that, that, that we could help virtually any kind of company, regardless of its, you know, whatever vertical, whatever you want to use. It took me a long time and has taken me a long time to get to the realization that I cannot save anyone. They can only save themselves. Mm-hmm. They can only do the work. I can't do the work for them. I can give them tools and some things that they can learn, but the doing is their thing, right? And that's hard because, you know, you observe it, Perry, and you go, this person's struggling and they're banging their head and you, you want them to, to get better, to get right. And the reality is, is that it's a, it, it's a one person job, right? So when you look at that, um, because I, I, you and I have talked a bit, uh, before this show about relentless leadership um, and the places that you're going into. And I know you've got a great heart for what you do. This is not some, Hey, Eric, I just created this new business model. I'm going to make a lot of money and travel. There's a heart behind it. How do you balance that when you encounter the, obviously the great ones, the ones that say, yeah, okay, we, we, we've, we've polled, we've asked, everybody wants to versus those that either maybe give a lot of excuses or maybe talk about budgets and all the rest. How does that affect, how, how do you balance that just from a heart perspective? Personally, you. I don't judge or blame or shame, right? I talk to a lot of people and if, mm-hmm. and it isn't, again, one of my favorite sayings is it's not for everybody, right? So I don't, I don't have that preconceived notion going in. Yeah. I go in and talk to somebody and they'll mm-hmm. self-select. If it, if it resonates, they're in. Yeah. Right. And I have one of the tenants. It's funny that you bring that up because one of the tenants of, of relentless leadership is draw the line. And that line's at 51%, which means I'll help anybody as long as they're doing 51% of the work. I'll do 49. Won't do 50. Because I'll do 49. I'll, I'll be there. I'll support. I'll do whatever is necessary as long as they're doing 51. The minute I cross, the minute I get the 50%, I'm out. 
because I can't want it more than they want it. Have you ever had to fire a client for that kind of reason? Yeah. Without naming names. <laughs> <laughs> no, can you, I, can you give, me, give us an example of how that happened? Yeah, I mean, I, so you have to be clear about what you will and won't do. Mm. And, and you have to also do it for their sake as well as your sake. So I've had several clients that, you know, I'll meet with them month after month after month. And it only takes about three or four times. And if we keep talking about the same issue, again, I don't judge anybody. Yeah. But somebody at some point has to do something. So if they're not willing to do anything, uh, that's okay. But that doesn't mean I have to keep showing up and talking about it. I have to draw a line somewhere because if I'm willing to keep doing that, then I'm just supporting their habit. Almost an enablement. Idea. Yeah, because how many how many people that work in the space that you work in or I work in will continue to show up because I keep getting a check? Yep. Right. So I'm enable. I, I'm actually going contrary to the very thing I'm trying to accomplish. So at some point, it has to be about more than the money. It has to be about are we are we moving forward? Like are we? I want to work with people who want to make transformational change in their lives to make transformational changes in their organization, their community. And in the greater in the, in the greater world, right? I want I want the world to get better. I want it to be a better place. Yeah, that can't be tied to my revenue. If it is, I'm going to make bad decisions. Because you make those decisions based on revenue, not on right. Because they'll keep. I got news for you, man. Emotional novocaine is a powerful thing. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked with several people who love to keep writing that check because in their minds, I'm doing something about it. Like I'm I'm put I'm I'm paying, man. I'm fixing this. You know, it's interesting that you say that too, uh, Perry, because um, I was listening to this talk from Andy Stanley, and he said that you need to put, how did he put it? He said, uh, you need to put the motion into your emotion. Put the motion into mm -hmm. your emotion. Because the idea that that some action that I do, some some process that I take is a substitute for that doing is, I mean, it's crazy. But again, to your point, it can be, it can give you the false illusion, right? Well, it's, the, it's all most self-help. All the leader, the, the state of leadership development today is all about emotional novocaine. It makes people feel better, but does nothing to fix the problem. Man. I send people to a leadership development seminar, one or two days. I, I, I wrote a check. I sent you. I did my part. Why aren't you better? Yeah. Right. So uh, go read this book. You know how many leaders I work with who say, my goal this year is to read 12 books. And I say, what the hell for? <laughs> are you going to do anything different based on what you read? Or are you just marking them off? That is, uh, that's really, really good, Perry. And I, and I'm going to butcher the quote. I'm, I'm hoping that I won't. And I'm going to go ahead and just just out of my mind, I'm trying to remember. And it was, it was Josh Friedman was doing the uh, the presentation. And it was just a something to the effect of the end of knowledge is not knowing, but doing. That's the end of it. That's that's what it should produce. So I tell people the the way I tell people is my pastor said something one time, and I and I relate it the same concept to what we do. If your faith doesn't change you, it doesn't save you. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so if you're not doing, I call it the chasm, cross the chasm, mm -hmm. the chasm from knowing to doing. If you're not doing or be, and now here's, you want to get real ugly with this. Doing means behaving differently. If I'm not changing my behavior, yeah. if I'm behaving in the same manner no matter what I'm taking in, but I continue to behave in the same manner, I'm doing nothing. I tell people when I used to have the folks that were graduating from an MBA program, I said, what are you doing differently now at the end of your MBA program? Because if, if you haven't done anything differently, you haven't learned anything. So yeah. my, my, my cycle with relentless leadership is learn, do, become. It's a cycle, right? Learn what I need to learn. Then I do something different. Then I become something different. And then I continue that cycle. But I can't become something different if I'm not doing something different. So if I continue to behave in the same way I've always behaved, I've learned nothing. As we uh, are getting close to uh, the end, um, and you are guinea pig number two, uh, Jeff uh, found out about this today, um, <laughs> just as we were on the air for our, we were recording the last episode. And actually, you know what, now as I think about it, um, 
this probably won't shock you. Can you think of one example of time in your life, be it personal, professional, where you look back and go, that was one of the worst decisions I ever made. And then what did you learn from it? Well, unfortunately, there's a long list of those. <laughs> I'm in your tribe, Perry. <laughs> there, there's, a, there's no shortage of, of bad ideas or bad decisions. Um, I, I, th- I probably, one of my, I'll say it wasn't, um, the, you know, uh, Annie Dukes wrote this uh, book called Thinking in Bets, B-E-T-S. She's both a, um, a PhD in psychology and a professional poker player, right? It's an awesome <laughs> book. Oh, wow. And and she said one of the problems we have is we have to separate out the decision from the result because a, a bad decision can lead to a good result and vice versa. She said you can run a red light and not get hit by another car. It doesn't mean it was a good decision. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So to your point, um, I made a very bad decision that probably led to something good, which was one of the first jobs I had ended up uh, I was in 23 years old and. By the time I was like 25, I was VP of operations for a $20 million retail company, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I quit one day like that, like got in an argument with the owner. And he said to me, I still, it's clear as day, this conversation, maybe you should go home this weekend and think about reasons you should keep working here. My immediate response was in an elevated tone, maybe I got more reasons I shouldn't, I quit. I had no backup plan at the time. (laughs) Two small kids, mortgage, all that stuff. Oh my! But you know, worked out all right. So not in the short term, by the way. Well, well yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There, there are consequences. But you know, from that perspective, Perry. Um, so, what was the? I mean, I could easily maybe kind of back you into saying, "Well, I learned don't just quit on the spot." But no, what I learned was there's a different way to handle what you think, and there's also. Being who I am, you can talk about from EQ standpoint, whatever those things are. There's a bunch of different ways to think about it. Yeah. But I obviously was not very emotionally intelligent because I let my emotions rule my my decision making. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I also believe certain things I shouldn't have believed. And so I would never have done that the same way now. I'm not saying I wouldn't have eventually quit, but I would have done it in a much more mature, reasonable fashion. Mm -hmm. But I would also have shared one of the concepts that one of the tenets of of relentless leadership is speak your heart. I would have had those conversations with that person and really talked about what, what was underneath the statement that I said Mm -hmm. to see if there's something we can do about that as opposed to just that. Always like to end on a very uplifting point. Uh, Who's inspiring you? What is inspiring you right now? I get inspired. I have a number of clients here in in central Ohio. Uh, I have about 60 right now that work with me in some way, shape or form. And I am consistently inspired by these small business owners. And by small, I mean anywhere from a million to maybe 15, 20 million mm-hmm. that are doing such great work and they don't think they are. Mm. They're taking care of their people. They're, they're, they're paying them well. They're concerned about the right things. And they have a very profitable business to show for it. And you never know. Most of these people, most of these people are not even known. Like you wouldn't even know their business exists. Mm -hmm. And they're just day in and day out doing the right things by the people that work for them. And, and they're impacting their organization and their community and their families. And it's just, it's just really encouraging to see because otherwise nobody hears about them. You never know they were there. They're not, they're not on the front page of the paper. They're not in the, they're not in Columbus CEO magazine, but they're, they're doing the hard work and they're doing it well. I appreciate that. It's great seeing you today. Thanks for coming in. We enjoyed it. Good seeing you both. Uh, And uh, as we always uh, come back, because we'll invite, we like the wisdom. (laughs) For those out there in the audience that would like to get a hold of you to learn maybe more about relentless leadership Mm -hmm. or maybe some of the other things that you do, how do they go about doing that? Uh, they can email me or go to my website. So it's perrymoffmer.com, uh, P-E-R-R-Y-M-A-U-G-H-M-E-R.com, or perry at perrymoffmer.com. They can email me. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Everyone, thank you for tuning in today. We've uh, enjoyed our time with Perry. Hopefully you have as well. And uh, until next time, take care. Thank you. Thanks for subscribing and listening to the Spirit of EQ podcast with Jeff East and Eric Pennington. Spirit of EQ is a preferred partner of Six Seconds, the Emotional Intelligence Network. 
Six Seconds is a nonprofit organization researching what works in emotional intelligence. Best practices are shared through methods and tools that are global, scientific, and transformational. To find out more about Spirit of EQ or to request a speaker, go to spiritofeq.com. Our contact information is in the podcast show notes as well. And now for our special offer. Hi, this is Jeff again. I just want to let everybody know that if you have any questions or want more information about anything we've talked about, just send me a quick email. My email is jeff at spiritofeq.com, and I'll get right back with you. Thanks. Thanks.